Always good to see you all back again. We're um, talking about the fundamentals of religious authority, meaning how do you know what God wants you to do? Which is a good thing to be concerned about, to know what God wants you to do. And um, one of the things we have yet to talk about is what I'm calling a sense of perspective, which is an idea that I'm taking from something Jesus said in Matthew uh, chapter 23, where he uses an illustration of a gnat and a camel. And I think it's important to have that sense of perspective to see that there are big things and there are small things. There are matters of great importance that should be attended to first, and they should be the clear and the obvious. It is in Matthew 23, uh, beginning there at verse 24, that we see Jesus, I'm sorry, verse 23, excuse me, um, where we see Jesus teaching and pronouncing a woe to scribes and Pharisees. They are supposed to be the teachers, the leaders of Israel. But he said, woe to you, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin. I think it's cumin. Is that how you guys say that? I never say that, by the way. I always say comino. <laughs> That's what that is. I don't know. Uh, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. You tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. And I think Jesus' illustration is that perfect capture of the mistake we're talking about, a lack of perspective, <laughs> uh, a lack of seeing that big picture of, you know, the things that are genuinely important and weighty matters um, and things that are not as important that can be followed on. But have these others in place first. So back to the 23rd verse, there's a lot of things that I want to point out in the verse, and uh, so we'll do that here. First, um, first thing is what he said, you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. Um, this is telling me something, or telling us something very important, which is that there is such a thing as a weightier matter. <laughs> there are some things that are more important than other things. Um, more consequential than other things. The, the big picture, if you will. Uh, the right emphasis. It isn't that we, you know, I said so, or, or that, that we have agreed that it is so. It's that Jesus said it himself. You have neglected the weightier matters of the law. They exist. There are things in the law that are more important than other things that are also in the law. All the law is important, of course. Doing what God wants is always important in every detail. Of course it is. But look, there are things that are bigger, more fundamental, more consequential that have to be done first. And yet, he said, these things, the weightier matters you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So it isn't, you know, as... Too many, too many people say the big stuff matters, the little stuff doesn't matter, not important to get those things right. Well, that's error. <laughs> it's important to get everything right for God. It's important to pay attention to the small stuff. Um, Jesus himself said, whoever is faithful in a little is faithful in much. Whoever is not faithful in a little is not faithful in much either. That is true. It is. It isn't the case that you neglect details or you neglect things that seem to us to be small. That's not what we're advocating. 
what we're saying is there are things that are weightier. There are things that are more important. If you look at the way that Jesus set it up, it's um, you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, but you neglect justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These are being paired up together. You know, how does a tenth of the produce of mint for the year stack up to justice? <laughs> That's the point. What is tithe? Well, it's a strange word, but it means a tenth. You, you take off a tenth because the law of Moses told them that this is how the Levites eat. The priests don't have uh, lands. They don't have farms. They don't work on the farm. They work in the temple. Um, and because that is their job and they don't have the land, they have to get their food from somebody else. The other tribes provide that food. Each tribe gives a tenth of what they produce, and that's what the priest tribe eats. So it's right to tithe, and the Lord did tell them that they tithe all the produce of the land, all the seed of the land, which I think probably means everything that they're growing, because, you know, you can only eat so much seed, <laughs> and they're not, you know, it's not useful to give them seeds because they don't have land to plant it in. But you know what I mean. The tenth is valid and is binding and is something they're supposed to give to feed the Levites. That is an important thing. And giving a tenth of the produce of the land so that they may eat, that's an important thing. But here, you know, if you look for mint or dill or cumin in the law of Moses, they're not specified somewhere. That's, you know, the herbs are not called out one by one in some way. Um, the Pharisees and the scribes, you know, have gotten down to this level of detail now that, you know, and I'm not even sure how you do this. I mean, I know mint is, you know, a leaf. So, you know, how do you even count that? The rules that they came up with for counting that, for seeing, you know, what did you grow? This plant was here last year. How many leaves are new this year? And therefore, a tenth of those equals this much, you know. You see how it can get kind of crazy there in the detail. The point of it is feed the Levites. Don't leave them hungry and yourself without a teacher. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. That would be of no benefit to you. This is, that's the point. Not, you know, how do you count mint plants? How do you count leaves? Which ones are new versus last year? Which ones are good versus bad? You know, that's not the point of the law, but that's where their emphasis is. So mint and justice, how do they stack up? You know, dill and mercy. You know, I like dill. I'm big into the pickles. I know not everybody likes the pickles. Yeah, I'm down with it. And that's cool. When I can go to the sandwich shop with Zach, I will tell them, I'll take his pickle. Let me have that. And uh, cumin, of course, gomino, it's like that's everything. <laughs> but um, how do they stack up to mercy? How do they stack up to faithfulness? The point being, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? That the count of mint leaves, the count of mint plants, the determination of what leaves and how many, like, how important is that as compared with justice? It's not. It's not important compared to justice. It's not something that should be neglected. The priests should eat. Of course, they need to eat. You need to tithe. You need to give a tenth if you're under the old Israelite law. And our law is better. But they have um, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. They have neglected these things focusing in on the herbs in great detail while leaving off the justice, the mercy, the faithfulness. It's supposed to be obvious. That's the point. It should be obvious that these are not the same kind of thing. They're not equivalent. There's something here that's much more important and ought to have the emphasis and ought to be attended to and ensured 
And in the end, I'll go back, you know, I go back to the beginning for the end, which is the emphasis that the scribes and the Pharisees have put on the herbs for the tithe reveals that their thinking is hypocritical. This makes them hypocrites. What is a hypocrite? Well, it's an actor. A hypocrite, somebody, you know, they say they care about God, but they don't really. Is what it means. Fake religion. They say they love God, but their actions deny that. So here, you know, the the tithe is required in the law. Yes, it is. And feeding the Levites is an important matter. Yes. And if they are like me, they need their comino. But that's not nearly as important as justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And those are the things that the scribes and Pharisees have left behind. This is why you see them mad at Jesus for healing people on the Sabbath. People in great pain and great suffering who have been bound by Satan for many years with various afflictions, and they're mad at him for doing it on a Sabbath day when there's nothing in the law that says such a thing. There's no law against doing good. That's a lack of mercy. In some sense, it's a lack of faithfulness because it's not, uh, it doesn't have, bear a true fidelity to the word itself. Nothing in the law would prevent you from doing good like healing. That's not work. It's not justice either, because it's their own court of opinion, not God's court and God's law. So those things are being left out, uh, among other things, lots of things that you can read throughout the Scripture. <laughs> but this is hypocritical thinking. And he says, blind guides straining out a, knot, a gnat, swallowing a camel. Right. Uh, we can see, you know, a gnat is a very small, you know, insect. That is an annoying thing. Yes, you don't want that in your ointment or in your drink. I understand. But it's one thing when you're focusing in to strain out the gnat. But meanwhile, you swallow this entire camel. <laughs> That's a problem. That's what he's getting at. That's the illustration. The concern for mint, dill, and cumin is like straining out the gnat. But the lack of concern for genuine justice, mercy, faithfulness, that's like swallowing a camel. You miss the whole point. That's not what the law of Moses was intended for. All right, so it's just saying perspective. Right? We, we got to see things the way that Jesus sees them. And then um, I found an example in Matthew 15 of what we're talking about here. So let's start with the gnat, if you will. The gnat is what is it that defiles a person? And uh, let's get started in, in this. The Pharisees and the scribes, they're the ones who got called out in Matthew 23, remember. But they came to Jesus and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat. And here I've noted that they are putting an undue emphasis on the tradition of the elders. That's neither here nor there when it comes to the law of Moses. Specifically, their problem is they're not washing their hands before they eat. It's thought that this was probably some kind of ceremonial washing or whatever. I don't know. Probably they're not that concerned about hygiene. They're probably talking about some kind of ceremonial purification, whether that be from uh, the marketplace, the, the Gentiles perhaps who are there, or that be you know something about the food itself that they think is ritually impure or might have some question about it that gets washed away i don't know it's not important because the law doesn't prescribe anything of this nature that's the bottom line so in the sense um i guess we want to make a distinction that 
what the Pharisees are asking for is actually not even something um, that we're concerned about at all. It's not, it doesn't fit what Jesus said earlier, these heavier things you ought to have done without neglecting the others. This can be neglected because it's not in the law. But the bigger picture is kosher, you know, the clean and unclean foods. That's what they're talking about more than likely. But the washing of hands, that's not in the law. Clean and unclean is in the law. Washing of hands is not in the law. Clean and unclean, though, it is in the law. It shouldn't be neglected. But that is a gnat. That's a gnat. Matthew 15, 10 to 11, he called the people to him and said, hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that makes a person unclean. It's what comes out of the mouth. This defiles or makes a person unclean. That's very straightforward. It's not what goes into the mouth that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of the mouth that makes you unclean. 17th verse, he begins to explain it. Don't you see? Whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled. <laughs> True. It comes out, you know, as they say, when you have the, you know, the first time parent, the child, especially the toddler, finds so many things on the floor. <laughs> and the answer the answer is, this too shall pass. <laughs> this too shall pass. It's true. Don't you see? Whatever goes into the mouth passes through the stomach and is expelled. Yeah. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This makes someone unclean. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness and slander. These are things that make a person dirty. But to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't make anybody dirty. Oh, that's Mr. Doug. Uh, to eat with unwashed hands doesn't make anybody dirty. That's, there's no ritual impurity. There's no spiritual uncleanness about that lack of hand washing procedure or tradition that their um, rabbis over the centuries came up with. That's not actually in the Bible, and therefore it cannot be bound upon the people. Kosher eating can be bound, but it is a gnat. As Jesus said, the point of that um, diet, the point of those uh, distinctions, is the spiritual application to the idea that we want to touch clean. We want to produce clean things. So in the same way that in Matthew 23, he said, you know, you, you tithe um, mint, dill, and cumin, but neglect justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And you can compare mint to justice, <laughs> um, so also here, you can compare eating with unwashed hands to murder or adultery or fornication. And you, you can see there's a big difference between those things. They don't even compare. For that matter, even eating some food that was a forbidden food, maybe you didn't realize it, you bought it in the marketplace or whatever, that is a far cry from bearing false witness or slandering your neighbor. Those are very different things. One of these is more important than the other, and that should be obvious. There's a weightier matter here. So the first pass, I guess, um, you know, the first pass is that question about the gnat. What is it then that actually makes somebody unclean? The second pass is to look at the blind guides, straining the gnat and swallowing the camel. Hypocrites. And that's where Jesus replied to them at the beginning in Matthew 15, verse 3. 
Remember, they asked him, why do your disciples break the traditions of the fathers? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. Jesus answered them, Matthew 15, 3, beginning, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? One of these questions is better than the other, isn't it? Why do your disciples break the traditions of the fathers? Why do you break the commandment of God? One of these questions is better than the other. You see the difference, right? Should we even say one of these questions is weightier? <laughs> the weightier matter of the law, the more important thing. But no, they, they're breaking the commandment of God for the sake of this tradition. They're worried about binding the tradition, and yet the tradition is breaking God's commandment. God commanded, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. Honor, um, I, I realize this has to be explained almost every time we talk about it, but honor means financial support. Um, the meaning of the commandment, honor your father and mother. While it's true that parent or that children are to listen to and to follow the instructions of their parents, that is true. That's not the meaning of the commandment, honor father and mother. Honor your father and mother means to care for them in their old age or in their incapacity. If they become disabled or if they are not well enough or are young enough to work to provide for themselves, their care is upon you. You're responsible for them to provide for them in their time of need after they took care of you in your time of need, bringing you up from infancy. Right? Let them first learn to repay their parents, make some return to their parents, give back at home. This is pleasing to God. So a person who refuses to do that must surely die. That is to say, under the law of Moses, if you refuse to take care of your mother when she is an aged widow and in financial distress, then you are worthy of death. That's the law of Moses. And the New Testament says something very similar. A person who refuses to care for his own, provide for his own, is worse than an unbeliever. All right, so God commanded this, but you say, the Pharisees and scribes put it this way, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God. He does not need to honor his father. Meaning, if they contribute it to the treasury and they don't have any more that they can give, then they are not required to honor their father and mother. They have, they have to give to the treasury first. That's their command. And Jesus said, Therefore, for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. They voided the word of God by human tradition. God commanded them to care for their mother and father. There's not another way to fulfill the commandment but to do it. And there's not an exception to the commandment of God to care for the mother and father. That has to be done. That's part of your charge. And that means perhaps that it cuts into what you're able to contribute. Maybe, or maybe you should keep giving to God what is his due and you do with less instead of him or instead of those who are dependent upon you. But it's for the sake of tradition that they avoided the word of God, and this is what is hip hypocritical. They're faithful to the Bible as long as it's convenient. But then when there's something else that they would like to do, they come up with another way of interpreting this, another way of reading this. A different take. That's hypocritical. That you're just pretending. He said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. Centuries before, the prophet Isaiah said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. 
That gets right to it. The heart is the matter. When it comes to hypocrisy, in this case, the heart is the matter. The problem is the heart. The honor is there with the lips, but the heart is far away. It looks like they worship God. It looks like they're right with God. They wear the titles. They wear the robes. They talk the talk. But in point of fact, what they're doing is voiding God's word and God's commandment. The heart is far. In vain do they worship. It's worship. And people think, well, what else do you want? I'm worshiping. Well, what he wants is your heart. It's vain. Why is it vain? Because they've supplanted God's teaching with their own teaching. Um, and, you know, the end of this verse is a little difficult, I think. Teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. But it's worse in Greek, which is teaching as teachings, the teachings of men. <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty funny, but I think what it, it points out um, is fairly plain, actually. They're putting out that this is the teaching of God when actually it's the teaching of men. That, it's fairly plain what that means. And when we put out what is actually just the commandments of men, the teaching of men, then our worship is in vain. And our devotion to him is in serious question. But this is a method of interpretation, friend. That's what we're talking about. Perspective. Look at the big picture here. Does this honor God? How could a person think it would be okay not to take care of dear old mom? Not to provide for her in her time of need. How could you think that was okay? Your heart would have to be far away from him. Then the 12th verse, the disciples came and said to Jesus, don't you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? I bet they were. <laughs> he answered, every plant my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. What does that mean? That means this kind of thinking didn't come from God in the first place. This is not a plant that God planted. You are seeing the outgrowth, the, the sprout, the leaf, the bloom of something that is evil, not something that is good. They're not coming from the Bible. They didn't allow the Bible to prescribe what they should be and what they should do. They had their own tradition, their own way that they came up with that they think is probably consistent with the Bible whenever they bother to check. That's not the same thing as having a God-directed life, um, of having you know, genuine religious authority, letting God dictate what it is that you ought to be and ought to do. They're not a plant that the Heavenly Father has planted. They're coming from something else. Leave them alone. They're blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both fall into the pit. And this is what told me, this blind guides here in Matthew 15 14, is what told me that it was tied directly to Matthew 23 that we started with when he said to them, blind guides, Matthew 23, 24, blind guides straining the gnat and swallowing a camel. The scribes and Pharisees are the, yeah, the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus said to the disciples, leave them alone. They're blind guides. Don't follow these principles, is what he means. If the blind lead the blind, both fall into the pit. Don't follow these principles. They lead to hell. That's what he's saying to them. Not, you know, poor blind people being led by the blind. No, the blind person should know. If they're seeking a guide, if they're seeking somebody to take them by the hand, they shouldn't be doing that with somebody else who is also blind. You don't do that. You choose a sighted person if that's what you need. So don't follow these principles. Those don't come from God. Those don't come from the word. Those lead to hell. Both fall into the pit. That's what he's saying. That's literally true. If a blind person is leading another blind person, they have a, a great, you know, a, a great chance of falling. 
But he's talking about the Spirit fairly clearly, I think. And this is about perspective. Again, it should be obvious, plain to see, if you'll pardon the pun, that if the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the pit. That should be clear. Why do we say that should be clear? Because the disciples said, don't you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Well, what he's telling the disciples is, why are you concerned about that? Does this surprise you? Look where they came from. Of course they didn't like that. They're not looking for the word. They're not letting God dictate through his word. Of course they didn't like that. It disagrees with what they think. And what they think is their God. Not the real God. Not the real word. Every plant my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. God didn't plant that. They didn't come from God. All right. Well, let's talk about weightier matters one more time as an invitation about God guiding us in religious authority. Again, we're looking at this in the context of how do you know what God wants you to do? It is important to have a sense of perspective, to know that there are things that matter more. There are things that are greater and heavier things that should be the emphasis. Um. I appreciate it. I'm going to, call, you know, and I don't mean I don't mean to embarrass you, Colton, but I'm going to call you out. I had a, a very encouraging study with with Colton a little while back, in which he said, "There's things should be fairly clear. You should be able to find a handful of verses that spell it out for you." I agree. That was really helpful to me. That helped. That opened something in my mind to start seeing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've had the emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, genuinely, that made me think a lot about this. And it's true. We should focus on the things that are fairly clear. And we should be able to find book, chapter, and verse for what we're saying and doing. And that should be something you can point to and say, well, here, this is how, this is what they did. That's what we're doing. And go with that. Because that's where hope is, because that's when you know you have God's word. Um, the church at Thessalonica is praised uh, by Paul in a couple of chapters. The, or I guess there's a couple of passes, and that's the way that they wrote letters. Things that they're giving thanks for. First thing begins in verse 2 of chapter 1. The second thing begins in verse 13 of chapter 2. First, he said, we give thanks to God always for all of you. First Thessalonians chapter two, or verse one. Ah, First Thessalonians chapter one, verse two. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we also thank God that constantly for this, the thirteenth chapter, thirteenth uh, verse of the second chapter captures that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. This is the big picture. I'm going to go back to the first chapter again, second and third verses. Notice, they remember the work of faith, the labor of love, the steadfastness of hope in Jesus Christ. This is the very first thing that he says to them in the letter, right out of the gate. The first verse is who's writing the letter and to whom. It's just the greeting. The second verse, what do we give thanks for? What's going well? First thing is work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of hope. You all are doing right. We are thankful for this. Second thing is you receive the word of God as it really is the word of God, not the word of men. They didn't take it as the tradition of the fathers, as a participation in somebody else's tradition, culture, cultural heritage, philosophy, methodology. It's not that. It's the word of God. God said this. These are fundamental principles. They're the most important things. 
And I would turn to 1 Corinthians 13 regarding, you know, that first chapter, the three things he mentions is their work of faith, their labor of love, their steadfastness of hope. And I realize that faith, hope, and love are large things according to 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13, where he said, faith, hope, and love abide, meaning after all the miraculous things of the New Testament are done. When there are no more healings, there are no more speaking foreign languages you don't know, there are no more prophecies or other manners, uh, matters of miraculous um, things they were able to do for a time, for a purpose. There will still be these three things, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love because that's where the heart is. Not trying to be mushy, trying to say that's where the heart is. Is your heart right with God? And we can see that in Matthew with the heart being, um, you know, in, in stark focus in contrast to the hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a matter of the heart, but so too is genuineness. Faith, hope, and love are the three big. We need all of these. <laughs> You have to be faithful. Of course, the faith is built on the word. Accuracy about God's word certainly is important and needful. Hope is also important because you, if you lose hope, this becomes too heavy and you can't make it to the end. You can't last if you don't have hope. If you're not pressing forward to something that is better, something that is greater, something that is worth it. But love is the greatest of these things because that's a heart that's right with God. If you love God, then you keep his commandments. If you love God, you know, then you love your brother as yourself. Right? Love is, is the most important thing. And that ought to be our emphasis as well. Love of one another, love of the Lord, love of the truth. There's a lot of things that are heart matters to talk about. But it goes back to authority. How do you know what God wants you to do? And how do you know what God wants you to be? It's a heart matter. And these are the greatest things, the most important things. All right. So again, we speak of these things as invitation, the invitation of heaven for you to obey God from the heart. If you believe that Jesus is the king that God has installed, if you believe that God raised him from the dead, then you can understand that God can raise you from the dead too. Whatever your circumstance or whatever your problem, God can overcome that. If he can raise Jesus, and he can, he can raise me too. However bad I have been or whatever wrong I have done, it's not like what happened to Jesus when they put him to death. God has the power to overcome these things and to help you to become somebody new, somebody different, somebody else. Which is the power that is granted to you through his word, but also through his mediation on your behalf. Jesus came here and lived and died that way so that he would know what it was like to be one of us. And so he could be in heaven at God's side advocating for us standing up for us and talking about how hard it is and what it feels like. He knows because he's been here. Um, we have that kind of a merciful God and, and priest in heaven who can be yours if you will obey him. Obedience to him means putting to death the old person of sin and burying that person. The burial is a baptism in water because it's what the Lord commanded. But it's also where the blood of Jesus washes away every wrong thing. And it's the grave from which you are resurrected a new creature created in Christ Jesus for good works, a Christian. We've made sure there is water available if you need to obey the gospel because we want to help. We want to encourage you if that is you realize that you need to repent. You realize you need to make things right with God. You realize that your soul is in jeopardy and you're not ready for the judgment. 
the thing to do is to get ready, become a Christian. If you're not a Christian, that's the call. If you are a Christian, but you haven't lived right, the call is to repentance again, to pray God for forgiveness, but to ask for the prayers of the saints on your behalf too to be strengthened, which we'll do gladly. If you need our prayers or you need to be baptized, please let, us, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. Mm-hmm.